Hello, good evening, everyone. Good evening. Sorry I'm a few uh, minutes late this evening. Thank you so much for joining. Um, I'm going to give everyone a chance to join us. As you join in, please um, uh, wave to me or put your name in the chat. I want to make sure that I have a chance to welcome everyone. So um, as you join in, please be sure to uh, wave or put your name in the chat. Also, please, as you join in, if you think this inf information might be helpful to others, please like and share. That way more people can get this information, okay? So we'll get started in just a, a few seconds. Oh, thank you, Lisa. Thanks for joining. Thank you, Lee. Thanks for joining. Thank you both for joining. I'm excited and thankful that you are here this evening. We're going to be talking about the flu vaccine. This is that time of year when um, a lot of my patients have questions about the flu vaccine, so we're going to um, talk about that briefly. We're going to talk also about the COVID-19 vaccine, um, what's going on in terms of where we are um, with the different vaccine, uh, progress with the vaccine in different parts of the country. And so um, I'm look, looking forward to our chat this evening. And I'm going to save some time at the end so that you guys will be able to ask questions. Hi, Sean. Thank you so much for joining today. Hey, Kim. Thank you so much for joining today. I appreciate y'all being here. Wonderful, wonderful. Okay. Well, it's uh, 7.34. And again, I'm sorry I um, logged on a little bit late. I wanted to um, make sure I was able to uh, to get this information to you guys, so I didn't want to cancel until next week. Next week, we're actually going to talk about abnormal pap smears, which is something that a couple of you have asked me about. So we're going to um, talk about that next next week, okay? All right. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Lisa. Thank you guys again for joining. If you um, are on and you think other people might benefit from hearing this information, please um, like my page, Dr. Madeline MD, and also um, hit share and that way other people might be able to, to take a look. Okay, well, let's go ahead and get started. I'm Dr. Madeline, MD, your board-certified OBGYN international speaker and published author. I am very passionate about helping uh, very busy women. I'm an OBGYN by training, but I help all people, but mostly very, very busy women uh, access the GYN care that they need and also birth control care that they need. And so by doing that, I help women have maximum freedom and control over their lives so that they can get everything done that they need to get done, okay? If um, you enjoy this information, please, by all means, check me out on all social media platforms, on Twitter, uh, Facebook, and Instagram at Dr. Madeline MD. That's D-R-M-A-D-E-L-I-N-E-M-D. So again, thank you for being here, and we're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you, Arnett. Thank you for being here. I appreciate you joining. So let's, um, let's go ahead and get started. I've been getting a lot of questions about the flu shot, especially this year, because there's a lot of questions about what we should do, what's happening, how this year may be similar or different to uh, previous flu years or flu seasons. And so I wanted to spend some time talking about um, what we, where we are in terms of the flu season, what we know, um, other information that might help people make decisions about flu vaccines. You know, this is one of those things. Oh, hi, Cheryl. Thanks so much for joining day one. I appreciate you being here. So, you know, flu vaccines, the flu shot is always one of those topics that, you know, there are people who have big opinions on one side or the other. There are some people who always get their flu shot every year, and there are some uh, other people who just don't believe in the flu shot at all. And so what I wanted to do today was really just take some time to try to give as much scientific information as possible so that each of you who's listening or within earshot of this can make your own decision based on the information. I also, because this season is unique in that we are expecting to have, um, to see more COVID-19, I also wanted to give you guys some information about what, what we know is going on with COVID-19. So um, in my intro, you heard me say that I'm a board certified OBGYN and all of that. Um, I also, though, I'm interested in talking with you guys about vaccines and especially about vaccine processes and where we are with COVID-19 because I uh, also used to work at Centers for Disease Control for, um, oh, goodness, a, a long time, over two decades. And so I, I have some, um, I want to share with you what, what we know to be going on in terms of um, this vaccine, what the different vaccines that people are working on for COVID-19, but also um, what a usual vaccine development process is like. I think one of the reasons why there's some concerns, some um, 
some mistrust, some uh, some some challenges with this COVID-19 vaccine is because um, there maybe there hasn't been as much transparency, and there's also some historical stuff that has gone on with this country, especially when it comes to people of color and research. And we'll spend some time talking about that too, because that may very well be playing into some of the hesitancy that people feel about receiving this vaccine, especially um, with the timeline that we know is being used for this vaccine so far. So let's talk about the flu shot first. So um, flu season, as you guys may know, it generally starts around this time of year. So here we are, we're at the end of September and flu season will typically go until um, March of the following year. Uh, the flu shots, um, you may, when you're out and about, you may see that they're already available in many places. Uh, different um, drugstores have them, you know, CVS, Walgreens, uh, Walmart, different minute clinics, and also some of the hospitals and physician's offices have them available already as well. So um, there are different flu vaccines that are going to be available this year. So um, in case you guys aren't aware, the recommendation is that flu for the flu shot, because the, the flu is uh, basically a virus like COVID-19. It's a different type of, it's a different virus, but they're both in the virus family. But uh, because the flu, the influenza virus can change and shift every year, the recommendation is that when people want to have better protection against the flu, that they get the flu shot every year. And the flu shot is recommended for people starting at age six months, so a baby as that's as at least six months of age, all the way until um, the upper years of life, 65 and plus. Uh, so that's the recommendation. And again, the recommendation is that you get it every year because that virus that can cause the flu, it changes a little bit every year. Now, one of the recommendations is that some places the flu shot will be available as early as August. But one of the um, recommendations that a lot of clinicians make with our patients is that they wait until about September or October to get that flu vaccine so that they can have um, a better chance, I guess, to, to build up some immunity. Immunity buildup with the flu vaccine takes about two weeks after you get the flu vaccine. And um, you have a better chance of maybe uh, having protection against the, the flu, the, the virus that's causing illness for that particular year. Now, one of the things to keep in mind, some of the conversations you may have been hearing about the flu, uh, particularly for this year, is um, why what's going on with COVID-19 is in excess of what we usually see with the, the influenza um, season, normal influenza season. So normally um, influenza causes about maybe between 140,000 to about 700,000 cases every year, not deaths. People who actually we believe are diagnosed with the flu um, can be upwards of 700,000 people. And in terms of deaths that we attribute to the flu each year, it's between about uh, 4,000 and 20,000 every year. So one of the things that was talked about when we first were at the beginning of this COVID-19 pandemic is that we were seeing a higher number of cases and uh, a higher number of fatalities compared to what we usually see in flu season. And so that's one of the reasons why people were saying, oh, this, this COVID-19 thing is definitely um, it's more lethal, it has a greater fatality compared to influenza. And so um, that's one of the reasons that you hear that conversation. Now, in comparison, I, I said um, that for deaths for the flu, we see about 4,000 to maybe 20,000 a year. Already, and you guys, um, if you're following the news, and, and maybe you're not, I know there's a lot going on in the news these days, but we're up to um, over 205,000 deaths from COVID-19, attributed to COVID-19 in this country. So that's a, a huge difference. Um, and, and so, you know, it's one of the reasons, one of the many reasons we're taking COVID-19 so seriously on the clinician side. You know, um, it, it waves in terms of how it's covered in the media, but for those of us still working in the hospitals, we're still um, trying to make sure we have adequate PPE. We're still using our N95 masks. For certain procedures, we're wearing goggles, face shields, all of that, and then of course, PPE with gowns and boots and all of that. And so um, I just definitely want to um, make sure you guys understand the difference in seriousness that we've been seeing in terms of uh, influenza virus and COVID-19, um, the viral illness that's caused by COVID-19. So um, again, the recommendation for the flu shot is that anyone six months or older can get the flu shot, even pregnant women. A lot of times my pregnant ladies will come in and they'll say, well, doc, I'm pregnant. Is it recommended that I get the flu shot or will it harm my baby? 
they've done um, uh, many studies that have looked at um, the flu shot being given to pregnant women and um, it's been found to be safe over many many years of um, of administering the flu shot and looking at the data it's, it's been found to be safe and does not appear to cause any complications in a pregnant woman or her unborn child okay so that's also important to know about the flu vaccine um, the other thing to know about the flu vaccine is you know there are some places where people work where it, I won't say it's mandatory but it's highly recommended or almost required really that um, certain people get the flu shot every year and one of those groups is healthcare workers now the reason for that is because um, because the, the flu can cause such serious illness and people who have some some pre-existing conditions like you know respiratory illnesses people who are older similar um, risk groups to those who get sicker with COVID-19 the recommendation is that uh, healthcare workers and clinicians get the flu shot every year as a way to protect themselves but also to protect the uh, the, the patients and the clients that they work with so um, so definitely um, uh, another way that flu vaccine recommendation comes into play for some of you who may be watching this today, okay? So um, what are some of the ways that people can decline a flu vaccine? Um, I have some colleagues that, um, you know, like many of my patients, just absolutely don't believe in the flu vaccine. And, um, and some of them have an allergy to egg. The flu vaccine is actually made um, with parts of egg and so, for, for some people who have an egg allergy, it's recommended that they not get certain types of flu vaccines. Now there are um, alternative flu vaccines that are on the market that are not made with any egg in them and are thought to be safer for people who might have an allergy. And, um, and those vaccines are always an option for people. But you know, if, if you have, if you know someone or if you've seen someone really have a serious allergic reaction to something, you can understand why a lot of people uh, may not want to risk getting a vaccine if they think that it could trigger a really bad allergic reaction. You know, you don't want the, um, the, the reaction that's triggered to be worse than the actual thing you're trying to prevent. And so that's some of the thought process there. So um, what else to, to, to keep in mind about um, the vaccines? We're, we're, there's a lot of conversation right now about the increased importance of getting the flu shot this year particularly because we're concerned about another uh, COVID-19 wave in terms of what's going on with this country. So let's uh, talk about that for a minute because some of these conversations started early in the pandemic when we really didn't know, and we still are learning about COVID-19, but we didn't know a lot when we, um, when we started with this pandemic back in you know, March, April, um, et, et cetera. And so, um, the thought was that we would have a first wave and that that wave would be done maybe July or August and that we would be looking at a second wave that would start around September and coincide with the, uh, the, the normal flu season. However, it hasn't really happened like that, right? We're in this point of, um, of this COVID-19 pandemic where we're still pretty much in a large part of the country, not everywhere. Um, New York State has had um, a great trends in terms of really bringing down that curve and having a, a low percentage of new cases and new deaths every day for, for several weeks now. But in many parts of the country, we're still in that first wave and in some areas it's even kind of bumped up compared to where we were in March and April and um, in May and June. So with that in mind, the thought process is that if someone comes in with, um, with upper respiratory symptoms, and, and one of the challenges we have as clinicians is that uh, someone who has influenza may present in a very similar way to someone who has COVID-19. And so some of those same symptoms, um, a sore throat, a cough, um, sneeze, fever, uh, respiratory um, uh, challenges, some people may have shortness of breath, uh, body aches is a very common sign that people uh, will report, a symptom that people will report when they have the flu. And, um, you know, and, and how will we, if someone comes in with these symptoms, what will help us make a different diagnosis of influenza versus COVID-19? Because definitely what is true about both of these diagnoses is that we want to get the diagnosis right and get treatment or prevention or supportive care started as soon as possible. And so um, one of the reasons behind the push for the extra push for the flu vaccine this year 
is that we want to, as much as possible, it's not 100%, because you can still have some um, co-infection. There are some people who can have both the flu and COVID-19. But to the extent that we can rule out one based on the fact that maybe someone had their flu vaccine and so we feel um, that it's less likely to be the flu that they have, then maybe we can hone in on COVID-19 and get started with things that can help that person get treated and recover more quickly. That's a part of the thought process behind that, basically in terms of why we are um, encouraging even more so for people to get their flu vaccine this year. Um, one of the other reasons I think it's a good idea to get it done, especially September or October, where, you know, October starts next month. It's amazing how quickly this year is going. But one of the other things to consider is that, you know, we have um, a lot of flu vaccines available, you know, over almost 200 million vac uh, flu vaccines available. We don't know what's going to happen with the COVID-19 vaccine, but there are discussions about the COVID-19 vaccine being available as early as November or December. I think looking at this up to you guys to look at the information, but I think you we're in a better space if we get our flu vaccines earlier so that we can um, tease out the difference with what may be going on with um, a potential COVID-19 vaccine that might be available in November or December. So let's talk about that some. There are currently um, many vaccine trials going on in this country and across the world that are really trying to get something quickly in place for a COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, one of the reasons for that, as I was talking about earlier, is that this uh, COVID-19 virus has had a really high fatality. And, and certainly um, scientists and clinicians are, we, don't, we want to make sure that there's something available for patients, but we also wanna do it in a, in a safe way. You may hear on the news, uh, people talk about the different phases of, um, uh, vaccine trials and so I wanted to kind of share with you guys what those different phases mean so that when you hear the different numbers phase one phase two phase three you can have a better understanding of what they're talking about so right now you'll hear about I think in the US there are three pharmaceutical companies that are at uh, phase three trials for a COVID-19 vaccine but what does that mean so it means that they're in the phase where they've done phase one which is what phase one with a vaccine trial you give it to a few people um small groups of people with a trial vaccine just to see if it works because you want to know okay does this vaccine have the potential to be the one that goes all the way if we give it to these few people what's going to happen and then you have um the phase two clinical study where you expand you give the vaccine to even more people and in particular, you want to give the vaccine to people who are going to be a large part of your target population to receive the vaccine when it's ready and ideally after it's FDA approved. Uh, that is um, typically known as a phase two. Now, um, for at least three manufacturers, and they are AstraZeneca, Pfizer, and Moderna, they are, um, these manufacturers are already at phase three trials. That means they've already had phase one. They had an initial vaccine or maybe a couple of different versions of a vaccine that they did some studies on. It looked like the vaccines were promising. So then they moved them into phase two. They um, enrolled more people into their scientific trials to, um, to, to show even more so that the data looked promising. And so now these three pharmaceutical companies are in phase, um, phase three. So they've expanded and they've um, administered the vaccine. Their, their goal is to administer the vaccine to thousands of people. Now, one of the companies that is doing these vaccine trials, you may have heard in the news recently, they had um, a neurological reaction in one of the patients in Europe and they actually stopped the trial. They stopped the trial in Europe, they stopped the trial in the United States. And uh, they basically, when, when they stop a trial, what they're saying is that we see someone with, um, with a symptom or with a side effect that we did not anticipate. And so we want to make sure that that side effect is not due to this vaccine that we gave them. So that's why they stopped the trial. Now in Europe, they resumed the trial because after looking at all the data, they decided that this person who had sudden onset of new neurological symptoms, some weakness, some pain in different areas, that that person had a diagnosis of um, likely multiple sclerosis that they said is not related to his, his or her administration or receiving the vaccine. Okay, I don't know if it was a him or her. They, they try to really 
protect patients' um, uh, privacy when they're doing these trials as, as appropriate with any of these things. And so in Europe, that trial has resumed, the AstraZeneca trial has resumed. In the United States, however, um, that trial has not yet resumed. Okay, so, um, so they believe that the adverse outcome that they saw in Europe was not related to the administration of the vaccine. So here we are, we have um, in the US at least three front runners of pharmaceutical companies who are working on COVID-19 vaccines. Now the usual course of vaccine development, it, it usually takes um, many years. So some of, some of what's going on right now is that people, especially people of color in this country, they're looking at all these vaccine trials, they're, um, they're a little bit hesitant um, and skeptical because the timeline has been really pushed. Um, some people believe it's not really being done with um, a full concern for science. Some people believe that there are politics at play. And also there's a historical aspect. So uh, many of you may know, some of you may not know, but this country has a legacy of, um, of doing scientific research in black and brown populations without their permission uh, and done in ways that were uh, unethical. Um, I think one of the studies that people quote most recently is the Tuskegee syphilis study, whereby um, starting in 1930, and um, believe it or not, it continued until 1972, but there were um, black men who were enrolled in a study in the 1930s the, uh, the federal researchers saw that they had developed um, syphilis. And even years later, when penicillin was discovered to be an effective antibiotic for treating syphilis, the researchers who were doing that study intentionally withheld the penicillin as an effective treatment from those men. And those men, unfortunately, uh, lived out their lives with uh, syphilis, which can have um, really damaging effects. It can damage your neurological sim uh, system. You can get neurosyphilis. People can become uh, paralyzed. They can become blind. You know, having to live with syphilis is not something that's a benign thing. And so that Tuskegee syphilis study, which was um, broken by a, a journalist in 1972, went on for decades without those men knowing that penicillin was available as a viable treatment. In some cases, some of the men and their female partners and the babies that those women had um, were not aware that there was a, a treatment available. So, you know, it's, it's legacy stuff like that, historical stuff like that, that also feeds into why there's some of the distrust going on with, um, with uh, black and brown people in this country. Now, one of the things that they have also said about the COVID-19 va COVID vaccine trials that was um, has been put in place to try to encourage people or at least help people believe that there's uh, more of a vetting going on with this vaccine is that they've involved um, some people have uh, absolutely said mandatorily they will vet all of the vaccine data before they authorize it or recommend it to their patients so one of these groups is the national medical association the national medical association is the oldest association of black or uh, African, African American physicians in this country. Um, just within the last couple of days, the National Medical Association has um, stated in, in, in partnership with these pharmaceutical companies that are working on the vaccine that they will um, review and vet all data before they can, in good conscience, recommend any of the, these vaccines for um, the patients that we serve, the National Medical Association. That gave some people um, definitely lots of relief because, you know, you want to believe that someone who's going to recommend this vaccine to you would recommend it to their mom, their dad, their sister, their brother, that they truly have your best interests in mind if they're recommending this vaccine for you. So uh, that's one group that's going to be looking at the data very carefully. Also, um, Governor Cuomo of New York State has said that New York State is not going to authorized distribution of the COVID-19 vaccine until his state has reviewed all the data as well. So I, I, I say that just because I want to, again, give you guys some, some facts to, to consider for your own um, and, and also just give you some resources so that, you know, as, as information is developing about the COVID-19 vaccine, if you're um, having, starting to have questions, if you're thinking you want to consider getting it, there are um, definitely different channels to to consider and different places to go to get some information. And so I definitely want to encourage you to, um, to do that. So um, 
I think I'll stop there. I always promise you guys I, I went over my time a little bit. I usually want to talk for about 20 minutes, but I also wanted to make sure, because this is such an important topic, that I gave you guys some time to ask the questions you have. Oh, let me start with one that I get from a lot of patients. A lot of patients will, will reach out and say, you know, Doc, I'm just not going to get that flu vaccine because when I got it last time, I absolutely got the flu from the vaccine. And so um, what is that about? So the, the vaccine, most of the vaccines are, um, you know, there, there are all types of vaccines. Some vaccines have live viral particles in them. Some have a dead or attenuated viral, viral particles in them. And so, and some persons who, um, to, who get the vaccine, the reaction that they have might be such that they feel like they have a mild flu. But it, it absolutely is not the case that the vaccine gives them the actual full-blown uh, flu. Um, but I, uh, again, I, you know, I'm one of those um, providers who believe that uh, patients, when they say something, uh, I think we need to take it seriously. And so I like to have conversations about um, what patients experience when they say they had a full flu. You know, tell me what was going on. Did you have a fever? What was going on? Did you have body aches? Let's talk about whether or not there was anything else going on that could have accounted for those symptoms. And um, what I'll also say to people, and you know, everyone's experience is different. I can tell you that there was one year, maybe about 15 years ago, when I did not get the flu vaccine and I got the actual flu. And that actual flu was the most miserable I had felt in, um, in many, many years. And I know after that, I was religious about making sure I got my flu shot. And I've not, you know, knock on wood, I've not gotten that sick again since. And so, you know, everyone's experience is different. But I do want to encourage you that if you're, if you're thinking about the, um, the flu vaccine, by all means, ask your provider different questions, see what's out there. Consider it, if you've never had the flu vaccine before, consider it especially this year because, again, we had talked about, we've been talking about another phase for COVID-19, but in reality, we're still in the first phase and in a lot of parts of the country. And we don't really know where it's gonna go, what's gonna happen. And so consider this year's flu vaccine as a way to protect yourself, especially in September and October, as a way to protect yourself early on ahead of what might be coming as we get into November and December. Again, the flu, um, the flu season goes all the way until March in many parts of, of this country. And so um, I think it's going to be particularly important this year that we're extra diligent because we don't know what's going to happen with COVID-19. And, um, and because I really want you to consider all of the information. If there is a vaccine, COVID-19 vaccine made available in November or December, please, please, please look at the information very carefully before you make a decision about getting that vaccine. Um, uh, again, this is, these are, I know we've been saying, you've been hearing this word a lot this particular year for 2020, but this is unprecedented. And I can tell you as a clinician, we are um, just trying to make sure that patients have as much information as they need, um, that they have the resources that they need, and that you guys stay as, as safe and healthy as possible. So with that, um, let me turn it over to you guys. If you have any questions, please just put them in the chat. Uh, again, I'm happy to, um, to answer any questions you might have. If you think of some questions after we are, are done with this um, Sunday chat, this uh, edition that happened a little bit later than usual, just because I wanted to make sure we talked about this because now uh, flu shots are kind of flooding the drugstores and the hospitals and the doctor's offices. And so um, if you guys have any questions for me, just be sure to type it into the chat. Okay, we have um, a question here. So, okay, so Lee's question is, this is my first time getting the shingles vaccine. What age should we begin taking the shot and how often should I wait? I want to take it this week when I get my flu shot. Oh, that's a, um, that's a great question, Lee. So a few years ago, they changed the recommendation for the shingles vaccine and recommended that we get it starting at age 50. So, um, so if you are in that age group to, uh, to get that shingles vaccine is definitely recommended. But what I would say is um, because the shingles vaccine is given in two doses, the last time, um, well, from what I remember, it's still in two doses. And so there is some conversation about certain types of vaccines needed to be given a certain amount of time apart so that you know so that you're okay and you don't have an increased risk of adverse reactions 
And so definitely talk to your provider. If you are, um, since we're in the, at the end of September, maybe get your uh, flu shot. And then two weeks later, when your antibodies for influenza are, should be in place, get the first part of your shingles vaccine. And then a month later, or, or you know, whenever it would be due, get the second part of that shingles vaccine. But, um, but absolutely, you're right to consider what are the, the different options in terms of the, um, the flu shot and the shingles vaccine. Both are important. Shingles is, is something that can be very painful. Shingles is, um, for those of you who may not be familiar, so um, I'm gonna, I guess Lee and I are in the same age group, so I'm gonna, you know, tell on myself. So if you are in the age group where from that you, when you were a child, you had chicken pox, you actually had the disease, you didn't, you know, these days our children and babies born these days, they are able to get the chicken pox vaccine. But if you had chick, uh, chicken pox as a child, um, you have the virus still dormant in parts of your body. And that virus can evidence itself as full-blown shingles at a certain time in our lives when we get beyond a certain age because our immune systems start to change and then shingles can evidence itself. So it's really just an evidence of the chicken pox that we had when we were children. And so the shingles vaccine um, is something that is meant to prevent us from having a full-blown shingles outbreak. Shingles outbreaks can be very painful. They um, basically are, are like clusters of blisters on the skin. And a lot of times people have to, you know, uh, stay home, um, be on bed rest or take uh, Tylenol or other medicines to help with the pain, drink a lot of fluids. Yeah, shingles is, 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 um, is not a joke. So yes, uh, Lee, if your provider is recommending the shingles vaccine, this is definitely something that's, that's recommended these days to help prevent um, anyone who might be at risk from having a shingles outbreak. So thank you, um, great question. Are there any other questions, guys? Either about the flu vaccine or about any concerns you might have about um, uh, okay. the shingles shot, the version that's out right now, um, Lee, should be a one-time thing. It's not something that you have to get every year. So um, great question, yes, but if you get if you get that um, that full series for the shingles vaccine, you should be good to go. Now, if you, let's say, you know, 10, 20 years go by and it looks like the antibodies have decreased in your system, it might be that your provider might recommend a booster or a, another dose at that time. But, uh, but you should be good to go with this, just the one for now. I have another question here from Cheryl, and she says, um, oh, a comment, and she's seen the results of shingles. It is my intent to get the vaccine soon. Absolutely, Cheryl. If, if you've seen someone with shingles, um, it's very impressive the amount of pain. Sometimes they can look like just really small clusters of things on someone's skin, but the pain and the discomfort that they feel from those shingles, it's, it's real. And so um, definitely that's encouragement to get the, the vaccine. Once you've seen someone with it, it's, it's not a comfortable process at all. Absolutely. So thanks, guys. Anyone else have any questions? about um, the flu shot or the COVID-19 vaccine and where we are and the things that I want you guys to think about, even if a vaccine is ready in November or December. Oh, here's a question I'll, I'll share with you guys. I had a patient ask me, um, you know, Doc, well, you've worked at CDC and you're out here. Um, oh, okay, it, it was your mom, Cheryl. Yes, definitely. It's something that evidences itself and, um, and persons as they get older. So, um, so absolutely understand that. Um, but one of my patients asked, what would I do? As someone who used to work at CDC, who understands vaccines, who, um, who sees patients, who is looking at all of this stuff kind of play out in front of us, my answer to, um, to her was that, uh, was not yet. I'm not yet at a place where I would feel comfortable. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm willing to, to look at the data as the data becomes available. I'm willing to um, read all that's going on from the different pharmaceutical companies. Um, and even, you know, read and understand what's going on in terms of whether or not there are any adverse events happening, you know, among people who are in the vaccine trials. But I am not yet at that place where I am willing to get a vaccine, uh, the first available vaccine. I think it's like um, a lot of things, you know, you want to see what's going to happen first. You want to make sure that there's good, strong data. One of the reasons why many vaccines take years to develop is that 
we're taking the time, scientists are usually taking the time to look and see what side effects happen, if any. And a lot of times those side effects may not happen until six months out or 12 months out or two or three or five years out. And so that's one of the reasons why um, vaccine trials, you know, when they're phase one, phase two, phase three, they're all done very carefully. Now, again, this is a different situation. This is a pandemic that has a high fatality rate. And so, um, so yes, people are moving the needle a little bit, but, um, but I also want to encourage you that if you are at a place, you know, like me, like maybe you won't be comfortable in November or December if something is available, I encourage you to continue doing the other things you're doing. You know, um, wash your hands 20 seconds or more, hand sanitizer, wear your mask when you go out, um, you know, um, all those social distancing, all of those things we know to have an impact and can be effective. You guys have probably seen the study that showed that if everyone wore a mask, we could significantly reduce transmission of COVID-19 by greater than 80%. And we can put a significant dent in what we're seeing play out with COVID-19. So, um, you know, again, if you're one of the people, we don't expect a lot of people to want to get the vaccine uh, if it is available in November or December. And there are many reasons why, including some of the historical distrust that's, that's happened in this country in terms of um, science being done inappropriately with black and brown populations. But again, um, I encourage you to, to watch the data carefully. And in fact, you know, as we have another Sunday chat, as we get closer to November or December, if you guys want to say, hey, Dr. Madeline, can we go over this stuff again? What do you think is going on? I'd, I'd be happy to come back and talk about this topic then as well. So, um, so thank you. Okay, great. Awesome. Lisa, she said great info. She's getting her shingles vaccine. Awesome. Sean said great information. Thank you. Wonderful. I'm so glad you guys joined this evening and that you got something out of today's um, Sunday chat. So if those are all the questions for now, I want to again, thank you so much for joining. It's, uh, it's my joy and pleasure to just uh, chat with you guys on Sunday. Thank you, Number. Thank you so much. I appreciate you, um, you being here. So it's my joy and pleasure to chat with you guys on Sunday. I'm glad we were able to get together, even though it's a few hours past my normal time. And next week, please stay tuned. Please join me because we're going to be talking about PAP tests. A lot of stuff going on with PAP tests. What does a normal PAP test mean? What does HPV mean? What does an abnormal pap test mean? We're going to talk about all that um, next Sunday at 4 p.m. I'll be joining you. And so um, thank you again for joining me today. I am Dr. Madeline M.D., your board certified OBGYN, international speaker and published author. I help busy women access tailored gynecology care and birth control to make sure that they can get access to the things that they need on their time so that their lives have maximum freedom and that they have uh, as much control over they need over their, as they need over their lives. If you would like to um, follow me, please, please follow me on different social media platforms on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. I'm at Dr. Madeline MD, which is D-R-M-A-D-E-L-I-N-E-M-D. And again, I thank you so much for being here. You all have a fabulous week, and I look forward to talking with you next week. Thanks all. Bye-bye. You're welcome, day one. You are most welcome. Mwah.